The Extraordinary Phenomenon Investigations Council presents Epic Voyages. Come join us as we enter and experience the great mysteries of the world with tonight's host, Pat Buskert. Good evening, everyone. This is Pat Uskert from UFO Hunters. I'm hosting tonight uh, for Epic Voyages. I hope you're all ready for an epic voyage this evening. Our guest is Dan Sherman. He's an Air Force veteran, and he has an amazing story tonight involving a, a secret government project and uh, communicating with, with extraterrestrials. Now, uh, Dan, uh, Dan, are you with us this evening? Are you there? I am. Yep. Great. Good evening. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, thanks. Excellent. Now, Dan, I, I read this book of yours. It's called Above Black. I actually read it years ago, four, uh, a few years ago. And uh, I, I just read it again last night, and I'm thinking to myself, this is either uh, one of the most important uh, books uh, about what is going on regarding ETs uh, and UFOs and uh, this this mystery of uh, you know extraterrestrials in general, uh, or or it's uh, you know it's it's amazing science fiction. So you're here tonight to 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 tell us all about your 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 book, and uh, and tell us which it is. Is it science fiction or is this is this reality? <laughs> well, um, it is definitely reality. Um, it's uh, it could definitely be mistaken for otherwise, though I'm sure. Okay. Okay. Well, let's do as any good story should do. Let's start from the beginning, my friend. Mm -hmm. uh, when, um, let's, let's start with how this all started for you. Um, well, in the beginning, um, well, there's, there's kind of two beginnings, the beginning that I know about and the beginning that they knew about. Um, which one do you want to go back to? Okay. Well, you know, I'm thinking let's, let's go back. Right. Now, let's go back to uh, the beginning in your book, and actually, let's establish who you are. Many people listening tonight will are hearing your story for the first time and want to know what makes you credible. Why is this story so credible? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, your, uh, your credentials, your Air Force history? Yeah, um, I went into the Air Force um, at, right out of high school. Um, okay. It was around 1982, and I stayed in for about 12 years. And um, right now, I'm just uh, I own my own business and I live in Arizona. Okay. And I have a family and pretty much a, just a normal person. I'm a conservative politically, which is kind of mm -hmm. odd because most of the people in this particular genre is uh, they lean a little bit more to the left. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not something that I uh, tout at the top of my lungs every single day of the, of the week. Sure, um, sure. Doesn't help your career, does it? <laughs> well, you know, whenever somebody has an experience that is as incredible as mine, um, it it really is a difficult thing to integrate into your regular life um, because because of the credibility issue. And I really struggled with that when I first released the uh, you know when I first wrote my story and, and decided to release it. Um, I struggled with the the ramifications of that, and I, I, I just finally came to the conclusion that it needed to be said or put on the record um, so that it could add to the puzzle of, of you know, what's going on out there. Um, okay, but well, it let's, definitely let's, has, yeah. uh, has impacted my, my normal life. Um, it's, because the uh, book is still out there? Huh? Or the, the, the experience that you, you've had? impacts your life or, or the fact that this book is out there well the, uh, the, the fact that I told the story okay you know, I told my sure. story um, 
it's you know when we always have my wife and I are we always have this um, laugh about when we meet somebody new and um, you know they get to know us and then we kind of break the news about the book. We either get somebody who's very interested and asks all kinds of questions, or we get somebody who reads a book and then doesn't mention it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Do they ever talk to you again? Yeah, well, <laughs> they typically talk to me again because uh, I think they have a problem with reconciling the story to the person because the person is nothing like they would think a person who is you know, crazy, so to speak, um, would, would write something like that. So uh, it, it's, you know, most of the time it ends up, they just don't speak about it again because they, they can't reconcile. They can't, they can't put it in their mind. Um, they can't match me with the story. So they just, they just decide to forget the story and just, you know, go on with the friendship. Just pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Well, there's a lot of that uh, when this topic comes up. So you're, you're a normal guy now. You have a family, you have a job, and you had this amazing experience. Uh, maybe uh, I think a lot of people out there don't really know anything about this experience. Could you s begin telling us the experience? Well, I, the book came out in, uh, it was 1997, I believe. And uh, 1996, and so it's been a while since it's come out, and I've I've spoken in front of probably over 100,000 people at conferences, and and the book has been um, reprinted like seven times, so it, it it has been out there. But interestingly enough, the mainstream media just won't pick up on it. Um, it you know, it, it's it's fairly big on, in the in the genre, so to speak. But uh, for some reason, it just doesn't get traction in the mainstream media. And, of course, this is true of almost any type of uh, um, story that comes out in this particular genre. So well, It's interesting, though, because you have big best-selling books like by Willie Strieber, you know, yep. Communion, and uh, yep. usually UFO and uh, ET-related books do rather well. Uh, and But you're saying yours... You know, what, it's kind of blacklisted or? Well, no, I wouldn't say it's blacklisted. It's a little bit, a little bit too I think real. it also, it doesn't fit um, the peg, so to speak, of of a commercial success because it, it essentially is, and when you read it, you'll you'll see, it is a A to Z, me explaining as best as I can recall, um, what happened from me, from when I was introduced to it to when I got out of the military. So I don't, I don't extrapolate a lot. Or at all, sure. um, I don't pontificate. I don't uh, um, make or uh, create a scenario that makes it more entertaining to the reader. You know, because you have these stories that are based on a true story, and they make it more palatable. You know, more entertaining, more compelling. Um, I don't do any of that. I just say exactly what happened, and that's it. I don't conjecture. I don't um, you know take something and try to make it bigger than what it was. It was just that. So as far well, as the I think, commercial I think that's aspect what makes, of it, that's, it just that's doesn't what makes fit your book. That, that, okay. you know, that mold. Well, that's why I, 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 think, I think that's why it hasn't done, um, you know, gone through the mainstream and, and belong, so to speak. Sure. Well, I just wanted to interject that I think that's what makes your book very powerful. When, when reading it, one doesn't get the feeling that you're, you're, you know, creating some kind of fiction here. You're not fluffing it up. There's no uh, laser beams. Uh, you're not taking a board <laughs> of craft to another world. It's very nuts and bolts. You know, yeah. you're you're in the well, military. I, you're taken into as a special special room, and you do a very simple job that involves uh, calming, communicating with an alien. Yeah. Maybe you can tell the story, to tell it like it was. Sure. Well, I always tell people uh, back to what you just said. I always tell people that if I were going to make it up. Um, okay. I would have made <laughs> I would yeah. have I would have made it a great story, you know, like oh my gosh, I just can't believe this and 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 made it more compelling and and put much more into it. But as it was, it was just exactly what happened and I put it down on paper. Um, well, it's good. And I can tell it's not very long. It's about 75 pages. Uh it's it's concise. It's kind of a this is what happened to me story. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, again, like I said, is, uh, we, we formatted it for the ebook at, at as short as possible because of the white space. But the actual book is it's about 150 pages. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think still, you read the ebook. Yeah. So anyway, relatively short um, for for a novel, like you're saying. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Not it too is. fluffed up. It's a quick read. Um. Yeah. It, I was in the military for a while, and I was how a long? specialist. I'm how sorry. long altogether? People want to know how long. Uh, it's about in- 12 years. I got out I got out at the 12 year mark. That's a long um, time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um I I started out as a security policeman in the in you know, I was in the Air Force and um about oh, probably 5 year 4 or 5 years into the into my uh career I was thinking about getting out and um they came up with a cross train and it was kind of unusual at the time because nobody was cross training and and uh, especially out of the security police field because it was so in demand at that time and so i i lo and behold got this cross train into the intelligence career field which you know required um higher clearances and and it re- required the access to areas that eventually I, I found out that I would need to get into in order to get into this program. And it was kind of a, a guiding, somebody was guiding my, my uh, career along into the, into the direction that it needed to go. And um, so eventually I got into the electronic intelligence career field. And the, uh, I, I got orders to go to a school to advance my electronic intelligence career field, career. Okay. And uh, that's where, kind of the ball started to roll. Okay. So exactly how did the ball start to roll? What happened? Did somebody come up to you? Uh, you know, was there, was there an email? How, how did it work? Well, um, I was there. I, it was at the Fort Meade uh, complex, NSA complex. Okay. And I, the, the first day I got there, I got a call from a captain who said that he needed to meet with me. And that was kind of the first odd thing that happened because typically when you're going TDY somewhere, especially a school, you, you, you are told to go, you know, to a certain place when you get there and then, you know, you're brought into a room to sign some papers or do something. Um, but you don't typically have a personal meeting with a captain. So, um, so was this was little, unusual. This is unusual yeah, that you're showing up and you're having a personal meeting Yeah, with the captain. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I uh, I met the met the captain at the location that he told me to meet him at, and we went into his office. And he proceeded to tell me that I was going to be there for another reason too, not just the two EA two eighty school, which was uh, an intermediate electronic intelligence um, uh, school, but I was going to be doing something else too. And then he unfolded this what could only be described as an incredible story in front of me. And it actually was so incredible that I, my initial thought was that this was some sort of initiation. Um, you know, somebody was going to jump out of a, a closet somewhere and said, ah, you, you fell for that, you know, that type of thing. So what did he tell you? Well, he told me that as a result of um, a communication that the government had had with an alien race in 1947, um, they, uh, among other things that they had done, one of the programs that they had instituted was one that was designed to um, manipulate human embryos so that the the offspring would have some sort of ability to intuitively communicate. And that was his words: intuitively communicate um, uh, with this race, or, you know, with the with the alien race. And uh, I was, I wow. just. Had- one of those people that were the offspring of, of this. Particular, uh, well, how did you how did you take this news that uh, you are uh, uh, the result of some kind of uh, experiment or genetic yeah. manipulation involving extraterrestrials? Well, the first question I had was was I human? Okay. Um, or that was one of the first mm-hmm. actual uh, concrete questions. I was going through my head like at first I was, I was like this is a joke, you know, I this can't be happening. But as he continued, um, he, he definitely was, he was either the best actor in the world or it was true. And so I, I started to, my mind started to, to go in the direction of believing this. And then 
one of the first questions I had was, was I actually human? And he said, yes, you're 100% human. Um, it's just that your genetic makeup was, has been manipulated so as to heighten this ability. He said, all humans have the ability. It's just that your, your genetic makeup was um, uh, tweaked, so to speak, in order to heighten this communications ability. Um, and Dan, let me just take a moment for, uh, for the listeners who are just joining us to let everyone know you're listening to Epic Voyages on Inception Radio Network, and we are talking to Dan Sherman about a government project that he was involved in, and he's a 12-year veteran, telling us this uh, amazing story. And now you are uh, you're getting this news that uh, uh, you you may have some kind of sp- special ability. Because of this, uh, this uh, embryo manipulation. Is yeah, right? they call it genetic management. Okay, genetic management. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> nice and concise, huh? That's right. So, what did they manage? What is the what did the management bring about? Well, it gave me the ability or a heightened ability to uh, intuitively communicate, and we'll we'll probably get into that a little later in the story as to okay. what what the actual mechanics of that is. But, um, yeah, so that was my initiation into it. And uh, he said that while you're, while you're here at the school, you'll go to your EA-280 school during the day. And then after that has um, broke for the day, you'll be picked up by a van at your hotel. And you'll be taken to a, a location for this school. And um, I, I would be taken to the, to the location. I would go down an elevator and there would be like this little room with uh, two computer stations and that's where I did my the rest of my schooling for the rest of the day so that was about four hours and then or it it varied between two and four hours and then the um the regular school was you know a full eight hour day during the day okay so so Dan let me get can I let me just get this straight here so you had a normal training that you would go through for a regular job and then after your long day of training, you would have to go for special training for this this other job, this secret project. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Those were long days. <laughs> yes, it was. That was horrible. Um, Did they pay you extra? Especially the um, what we'll refer to the the other school. It was a PPD school, okay. uh, Project Preserve Destiny. Um, okay, that's what wow. I refer to it. I mean, that's not okay. what they refer to. But that's what I refer to it in the book. So let's get this straight. What were you doing by day and what were you doing by night? What was the day, uh, well, the day. day job? I'm sorry. What was, your regular, what, you... what was your regular What was your regular position that you were training for? Um, well, our, my job as an electronic intelligence analyst was to take um, electromagnetic energy recordings of it, like radar recordings, and, okay. and then you break down the different elements of the radar and then you can uh, analyze it, and then based on our analysis, the uh, another group of people could build jamming packages so that we could jam the enemy radar, um, mm-hmm. you know, behind behind the enemy lines and stuff like that. Um, and of course, that translated into many different other areas. That actually, it was um, the career field that I was in had a lot of black project types of connections. So I could go into a black project, which of course that allowed them to cover the trail of me being in the co-located gray project. Um, so it's kind of an onion effect. And I go into that in greater detail in the book, but um, no, no, this yeah. is, this is interesting because a lot of people ask how, how can the military or how can the government keep secrets? How exactly do they cloak these top secret projects? A lot of people have problem believing that there are secret projects, but you paint a very interesting picture of how they how they do it or how they might do it. So yeah, tell us a little bit about this uh, cloaking of a of a a gray project behind a black project and this well, onion you're talking about. That way, um, otherwise uh, the the funding trail and. And personnel, you know, assignments and all that—that that would all be uncovered by people who have lower access, if and and people who uh, aren't in the know, so to speak. And it would just it would get out basically. So they they have this system in place where they have uh, layers of security, and um, you know, a base that you drive by, it might have 
Uh, the highest level there might be just for official use only. It's a very low-level classification. Um, some bases might have the highest level there might be secret. And then there are bases that you have black projects, and then within that, sometimes a base will have a gray project co-located with it. Now, not very many of them, of course, but um, but there will be they, – they, there has to be a black project at the base if there is a gray project because it has to be – uh, cloaked by the black project. And so I mean, black projects are secret enough. It's just amazing that above this secret black project, there's an ultra, you know, ultra super secret gray project. It's yeah. it's a, it's well, kind of genius actually. Well, and it's the only way they could do it. I mean, there, there's just no other way that you can. Uh, and, and of course, having a black project is a legitimate project. I mean, we have plenty of um, legitimate military projects that. Uh, are classified black that they're they're necessary to be classified black because if you know if the if the general population knows about it then our enemy knows about it and we need to keep you know an edge on the rest of the world um, at least <laughs> now we do if we're a benevolent nation um, but that's sure. the only way they can do it so you have to you have to justify the money that's going there you know for the project you have to justify the personnel that are going there and every person that works on a gray project they also have a a black project job you can't have you can't have somebody working on a gray project and not be also working on a black project at the same time and they may be and they're completely different from one another at least in my experience they were completely separate from one another. It's just that one hid the, hid the other. So you were already in a black program uh, in addition to being in a, in a gray program? Uh, not at that time, no. Um, <clears throat> the, was, you were just being trained at that time? Yeah. Now, I... I <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> in this particular case for the school, I wasn't actually... Um, it was kind of a... <laughs> it's kind of a, a a gray area, and excuse the oh, pun. But oh, Dan, come on! I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> mission ready, so I wasn't actually doing okay. a mission, and I wasn't actually communicating with an alien race at the time either. So it was just a training scenario, and so I I wasn't officially in a black project, but they treated it like I was in a black project. If if you understand what I'm saying, they the um the 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 orders that are generated to to um, well actually no I didn't even have orders generated for that so it, it, essentially they just they just extracted me and put me in a place that I was learning how to do something that would be covered in a gray project but at that particular time I wasn't in a black or a gray project. So it's kind of confusing, but well, this this is where it really gets good. Uh, in the book uh, above black, and I guess what you're saying is above black is there is there is more than black. There is above black. You're going to a gray this gray yeah. area, and, that's, and uh, that's, I'm just yes. That that's the um, that was the onus behind the 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 name of the book is it's a great know, name. There's a, a famous book out there called Above Top Secret. Uh huh. Right. Right. So, Timothy Good. Yeah, so I went one step ahead, or one step further, and said above black. <laughs> Did he steal so, your title? Did he steal your your name? I'm sorry. Did he steal your title? Were you were you aiming <laughs> no, for actually, above? I stole mine. <laughs> yes. Damn it. Well, he, he came out before me. <laughs> <laughs> well, above black is awesome. When I first came across it, I said, "I, I and, and your website, uh, aboveblack.com." I I had to I had to read it. I, I read the reviews of the book and what people were saying, and I downloaded it and I read it. It was pretty amazing. I said this this could be an amazing movie, you know. Uh, uh, and you you were in it. This really happened to you. You're telling me this this all really happened to you. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. take um, there, there's take been us about three screenplays that have been written, but no, again, nothing yet. It hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> Well, it's not over yet. You know, it took me years to get UFO hunters going, and I uh, never thought it would happen. And then one day, you just you get that email, you get the call. <laughs> so it's not over yet, my friend. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it would be a great idea for a movie, but people listening still don't know how it ends. So let's let's continue with this. Uh, paint a picture. What was it like? What was this training room? What where you finally learned how to communicate with 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 aliens? I mean, well, how, what was it like? 
I, I sure wish it was uh, made for TV or made for a movie because it was so boring, um, <laughs> the actual reality yeah. of it. Uh, was it was no... just a, essentially a, a particle board type, you know, a console that had a, a, a slant to it, you know, where, where um, there was a, a monitor uh, inset into the slanted area. Mm-hmm. And then there, I had a keyboard and, and, you know, that was it. I mean, no, <laughs> it was just a, a square room. It had a, um, uh, a mirrored area that I assumed that were, instructor was behind. I never saw anybody, um, but uh, other than there was another student that went to the school at the same time that I was going there. So we would kind of pass each other in the elevator. He'd come and go at a different time than I would, but we'd see each other once in a while. But um, we were we were instructed never to talk to one another. So we'd be in the room sometimes for two hours at a time. Um, two or three hours, we'd be in the same room, and we never once spoke one word to each other. <laughs> so there was at least one other person in the program that you knew of, but you never, you you never actually talked to each other. No, Lo- and, lonely. And interestingly enough, we um, we passed each other in the um, in the, the mess hall, the you know where where you eat uh, in the facility that that where the school was. Uh, I mean, my other school, you know the the regular school. Uh, we passed each other, and we kind of just grinned at, as we walked by each other, and we didn't say anything. But, but you knew we were we were instructed that we we could not talk to anybody about 